Welcome back to the world of Accurate, y'all, where we learn how to think like the College Board. Today we continue Unit 5 with topics 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, and 5.6. 5.3 is about the reasons why the Industrial Revolution began in Britain. Let's start with the improved agricultural productivity, called the Second or British Agricultural Revolution. The seed drill developed by Jethro Tull allowed for greater penetration into the soil for planting. The Norfolk four-field system of crop rotation removed the need for a fallow year that had existed in the earlier three-field rotation system. Instead, it included a year for grazing, which meant both increased feed for animal husbandry and provided manure for grazing. And it also involved turnips. These innovations increased crop yields on available land and reduced the need for farm labor. Finally, the Enclosure Acts consolidated small farms into larger, more productive ones, pushing out peasant farmers in the process, which leads us to the second point, urbanization. These now unnecessary peasant farmers migrated to cities and sought other employment. This provided the pool of labor necessary for industrial production. The larger pool of labor also facilitated specialization, with people taking jobs doing specialized individual tasks. Birmingham, for example, became known as the City of a Thousand Trades, with a variety of highly specialized industries. Manchester was largely devoted to a single industry, cotton textile production, but its cotton factories required a complex array of different specialized tasks. Britain also had an abundance of easily accessible coal and iron. The coal provided fuel for heating foundries and eventually the steam engine. The iron was necessary for production of mechanical parts and machines. The geographical distribution of all of these natural resources was also favorable. Coal was close to the ground and easily mined, and all these were easily accessible by rivers and waterways. This takes us to our next advantage. Britain has many easily navigable rivers, such as the Thames that flows through London and Irwell through Manchester. Britain's land is largely flat, so canals were easily built where rivers did not already exist. And it is also an island with over 7,000 miles of coastline, meaning it has many ports that give it ample access to seaborne trade. That leads us to this point here, access to foreign resources. By 1750, the British had a well-established maritime empire, with the most powerful navy in the world, as well as a massive fleet of merchant ships. We can connect this to mercantilism from topic 4.5. Britain's colonies provided raw materials such as cotton and timber, required for industrial production. In addition, British joint stock companies like the East India Company meant it also had access to foreign goods from around the world, such as India and Egypt which both provided cotton. This leads us to accumulation of capital. Britain's involvement in overseas trade, including the Atlantic slave trade, was highly profitable. This led to the accumulation of capital, money. Industrialization was a capital-intensive process, and the merchants and shareholders of the East India Company, Royal African Company, and others had accumulated the vast pools of capital to make it work. Finally, protection of private property. Property was one of John Locke's core natural rights, and one that the British took seriously. They had strong laws against arbitrary confiscation meaning the government couldn't just take your property. They also had strong patent laws that guaranteed the right of inventors to profit off their inventions. These protections encouraged the large-scale business projects and innovations necessary for industrialization, which takes us to the factory system. The first factories in Britain made textiles. Innovations like the spinning jenny and water frame meant that the weaving and spinning of cotton no longer needed to be done individually. They were now mechanized and could weave and spin multiple garments at once. These machines became increasingly large and complex, and required the work of specialized labor. In previous eras, it might take one person weeks or longer to make a single piece of clothing, having to perform the whole process one step at a time. Now workers were concentrated in ever larger factories, each person specializing on a single task. This is another one of those epic changes in world history. Since before this, as we mentioned in Unit 4, manufactured products continued to be made by artisans. From this point forward, more and more products would be made in factories. Many of these machines made use of the steam engine, which increased the amount of energy available by orders of magnitude. The combination of specialized workers concentrated in a single location using steam-powered machines meant that Britain's production increased 50-fold and made this tiny island country the biggest manufacturer in the world by 1850. This takes us to 5.4. This first part is about the share of global manufacturing. Before 1750, the largest production of manufactured goods occurred in Asia, particularly China and India. These societies had large populations populations and long traditions of production from skilled artisans, meaning they had always produced high-quality products at a larger scale than was possible for others. But after 1750, this began to change. Countries that were able to make use of the extreme gains in efficiency from steam power and the factory system saw their share of global manufacturing increase. Those who did not saw their share decrease. It was now a case of the industrialized countries versus the non-industrialized countries. We already mentioned how Britain took the early lead and became the world's largest manufacturer 
manufacturer of textiles. Steam-powered textile production expanded to other countries in northwestern Europe, such as France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. It also spread to the United States, which also had abundant natural resources, including the coal and iron necessary for industrialization, and raw cotton grown on cash crop plantations in the south. Industrialization would spread further to Russia and Japan. We'll look a bit closer at both Russia and Japan in topic 5.6. Non-industrialized countries did not stop manufacturing products, at least not at first, but their share of production decreased simply because they could not catch up to the increased production of the industrialized countries. Here's a college board example of shipbuilding in India and Southeast Asia. Before the Industrial Revolution, both of these regions had a long tradition of producing ships that were used as merchant vessels in the Indian Ocean trade network. But with mass production, the steam engine, and the factory system, European countries, especially the British, were able to outcompete these Asian producers and made ships that were higher quality and cheaper. Also, as metal hulled steamships became more prevalent, wooden sailing vessels became increasingly obsolete. Another College Board example is iron production in India. India had since ancient times been a major center of ironworks and continued to smelt iron in this period in small furnaces. But once again, states like Britain, who used industrial production and much larger blast furnaces, were able to outcompete Indian producers. Another major reason for India's decline in the share of manufacturing was imperialism. But we'll need to wait for Unit 6 to talk about that. 5.5 has a technological focus and is about some of the specific industrial innovations and their impact. The first part is about the fossil fuels revolution. Fossil fuels like coal and petroleum contain a dense concentration of energy that can be released when burned. Doesn't that hurt the environment, Mr. Eichard? Immensely. We'll get to the effects of that in Unit 9. But for now, we need to get excited about how the fossil fuels revolution greatly increased the energy available to human societies. Fossil fuels were used in two engines that you need to know, the steam engine and the internal combustion engine. We mentioned the steam engine earlier, and the improved design by James Watt was used early on in the textile industry. A steam engine uses coal, which is burned in a boiler that heats water, which turns into steam and expands. The expansion drives a turbine or piston, which drives the engine. The internal combustion engine follows similar principles and most commonly uses the fossil fuel petroleum. This engine is capable of producing even more energy, and Carl Benz used it to develop the first petroleum-powered automobiles. Both of these engines function by turning heat energy into mechanical energy. This was a true revolution because before this, the vast majority of activity, agriculture, transportation, manufacturing, mostly relied on human and animal energy, with the occasional help from wind and water. Now on to the second industrial revolution that occurred in the second half of the 19th century. The steel industry was revolutionized by the invention of the Bessemer process, which greatly improved the scale and speed of steel production. The steel was also both cheaper and higher quality. Steel was used in construction and transportation industries, allowing for the creation of skyscrapers, cars, and ever more powerful and efficient machinery. Chemical industrialization also occurred, with innovations like synthetic dye. Previously, dyes had been imported as luxury items, but now could be made cheaply and at large scales. Aspirin was developed by Bayer in 1897. Electricity was made available as another energy source with the invention of the dynamo in 1871. Soon after, the light bulb was invented by Thomas Edison, lighting up cities around the industrialized world. Nikola Tesla developed the use of alternating current, which made it possible to transmit electricity over greater distances. The development of standardized precision machinery was used in inventions like the typewriter, and later used in the assembly line developed by Henry Ford. The fossil fuels revolution and the innovations of the second industrialization fueled even more innovations, especially in transportation and communication. Railroad systems, which made use of both steam-powered trains and steel production, revolutionized land-based travel. Steamships did the same thing on the sea. It became much faster and cheaper to travel around the world and to interior regions. Like the Wild West! Yes, the western United States, eastern Russia, the interior of Africa, everywhere became easier to get to. By the mid-19th century, Britain had constructed nearly 10,000 miles of railroad. By 1870, the United States had more than 52,000 miles of it, most notably the Transcontinental Railroad that stretched across the entire nation. The Russians completed the Trans-Siberian Railroad in 1899. These railroads also facilitated even more industrialization because it came easier to access and to transport the natural resources like metals and timber. And the telegraph, which made use of electricity, allowed for nearly instantaneous communication. Now we're moving on to topic 5.6, industrialization, government's role. The surge in productive capacity from industrialization also shifted the balance of power politically, with the industrialized nations becoming the great powers of the earth. Some leaders of non-industrialized states saw this happening and attempted to be on the winning side of this historical trend. We'll look at the examples of Egypt, Russia, and Japan in the 19th century. Uh, Mr. Eichard, wasn't Egypt part of the Ottoman
Ottoman Empire? Officially, yes, but they had a large degree of independence under the leadership of Muhammad Ali, the Viceroy of Egypt. Ali was a shrewd observer of global trends and made a concerted effort to modernize Egypt. He first introduced the cultivation of cotton as a cash crop, which was highly profitable to sell as a raw material to industrialized nations, especially the British, for their textile production. But Ali wanted to go beyond cash crops and transition into the industrial textile business. He sent agents to European countries to study their methods and built cotton mills in Egypt. Despite some initial successes, Muhammad Ali's initiative largely failed for a few reasons. One of them was that Egypt did not have the same geographic advantages as Europe and America. There wasn't enough coal or iron nearby to fuel the engines and build the machines. Another was debt and financial mismanagement by Ali and especially his successors. And there were other reasons related to economic imperialism. In Russia, industrialization was the latest example of transformation from above. In other words, an effort to catch up with the West, commanded by the Russian czars. The Russian Empire's embarrassing defeat in the Crimean War spurred the desire for modernization. Tsar Alexander II freed the serfs in 1861 and commanded the establishment of an industrial economy in what was at that time an overwhelmingly agrarian society. Although Russia continued to lag behind Western countries, their efforts at industrialization had notable successes, and by 1914, Russia was the fourth largest producer of steel and the fifth largest industrial producer overall. Their extensive railroad network, especially the Trans-Siberian, was also an important accomplishment that helped to connect their enormous empire together. The most successful state-sponsored industrialization effort occurred in Japan. Last we checked on Japan, they were under the Tokugawa shogunate, whose policy of Sokoku attempted to restrict Western influence. But in the 1850s, the United States sent their navy to persuade the Japanese to open up trade relations. It was obvious to everyone that the Tokugawa navy would be no match for the American ships, and this caused something of a crisis in Japanese society. They were forced to sign the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854, allowing trade with the U.S. and ending the period of isolationism. The crisis led to the end of the Tokugawa shogunate and the beginning of the Meiji era in 1868. This was a complete transformation of Japan, politically, economically, technologically, socially, and culturally. The emperor was restored as an actual head of state, feudalism was gone, and the samurai class was abolished. The Meiji emperor himself issued the Charter Oath, which stated that public assemblies would be created and all matters of the state would be subject to public discussion. Was that like the Japanese version of popular sovereignty and the general will? In many ways, yes. The Japanese adopted many of the Western Enlightenment ideals in their government, in addition to seeking Western technology. The last sentence in the oath sums up their ambitions. Knowledge shall be sought throughout the world in order to promote the welfare of the empire. The Japanese empire sent agents to all the industrialized nations seeking knowledge. Just like Muhammad Ali did in Egypt. Excellent comparison. But Japanese efforts to study the West were on a much larger scale. As for industrialization, they began with light industry, like glass and textiles, including silk weaving. Eventually, they were able to transition into heavier industries like steel production and shipbuilding. They built a railroad connecting Tokyo to Yokohoma in 1872, and by 1900, every major city was connected by rail. Much of this was initially financed by Western powers, especially the British. But the Japanese were also quick to adopt innovations in finance and capitalism, with the state providing support for private Japanese family firms called Zaibatsu. We'll talk more about capitalism in 5.7, which will be in the next video. That's all for today. Thank you for watching World of Ikerd. Y'all keep thinking like the college board now.